So hello, this is Jim McRitchie. I'm here with co-host Eric Weinstein at Corporate Accountability Forums to discuss hidden agendas in shareholder voting with authors Scott Hurst and Adriana Robertson. Scott is an associate professor at uh, Boston University in, in, uh, at the law school and Adriana Robertson is a law professor at the University of Chicago. We should have plenty of time for questions and discussions. For those attending, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen or put a question in the chat. Um, let me just add that Eric and I have not set up any schedule for our future forums. A lot will depend on our own availability and what topics arise so if you have topics of interest uh, or you know of a speaker that would be interesting to the rest of us please let us know so without uh, further ado scott and adriana please start us out by telling us a little bit about your research on hidden agendas um thank you jim thank you for having us and thank you everyone for for being here um this is a project that adriana and i have been been working on for some time that we're um very interested in and maybe to give you the the brief overview we can start with three basic facts that i think many people on this in this group will be familiar with but which were, were our starting point in structuring the project um, and one is that only investors that own shares on the record date for a meeting can vote. Um, and that's important because share lenders don't legally own their shares on the record date um, and must recall their shares before the record date if they would like to vote those shares. And so the, the crucial part of the project is that with those two background facts in mind, there's no requirement that companies make meeting agendas public before the record date. And that's what got us started about this project and kind of, first of all, recognizing that fact. So part of it is, a, is an empirical project to look at the extent to which companies do make their meeting agendas public beforehand, and then to think about the effects of that, uh, the potential implications, and to propose a, a regulatory solution. Yeah, so in other words, uh, I guess the way I like to think about it is if you're lending your shares, you need to decide whether you want to vote before you know necessarily what there is to vote on. Uh, and that struck us as being kind of a not great. Uh, so, so the question, obviously, just because uh, issuers can do this doesn't mean they do do this. So we wanted to get a sense of how often this actually happens. So, you know, without going into the gory details, happy to talk about it. But, you know, we took pretty standard data sources like Edgar, um, ISS voting data, that kind of thing. And it turns out that this happens the overwhelming majority of the time. So overall, if you look across all meetings, it's something in the order of about 88% of meetings. Uh, that is very much concentrated in the annual meetings, so it's much less common among proxy contests and special meetings. Uh, no huge surprise there, I think. Um, you know, one question people often ask is, well, is there any interesting heterogeneity across which types of these meetings, putting aside the proxy contests, special meetings, and, and annual meetings? Uh, any interesting heterogeneity in which ones have hidden agendas and which ones don't? I think, honestly, the answer is not a ton, and that's mostly because when it's happening 90% of the time, it means it's happening for pretty much every meeting. So, you know, across any way you want to cut the data, it's probably happening, uh, right. basically more or less. Um, then, of course, the question is, you know, who cares? So there's lots of facts about the world. Why should we bother to spend our time focusing on this fact? Uh, you know, we we actually do think that it's important. It's maybe not the single most pressing issue out there in the capital markets, but we think it's worth shining a light on, especially given that we think there's a pretty straightforward solution, uh, sort of low hanging fruit, right? You know, voting is a priority. I don't think it's a huge lift in this particular group to say that shareholder voting is important. Uh, obviously, 
you know, institutional investors are major lenders. This is most important if you're lending your shares. Right? And so for institutions who do a lot of lending, uh, this is a serious concern. Now, we, we have spoken without naming names to some institutional investors, and it's been kind of interesting in these conversations that Scott and I have had. Some folks have said, look, you know, realistically, recalling to vote is just not something we're particularly interested in doing. That's just not our, our emphasis. Whereas others have said, yeah, this is something that, you know, we're sort of worried about. So there are differences of opinions, but at least at least some do seem to, to care. Um, we do have some evidence in the paper as well that lending behavior does respond to record dates. That's consistent with other findings in the literature, in the prior literature. So we're just kind of replicating some known facts showing they still hold. Uh, and that again is consistent with the idea that this stuff matters to the market. Um, and you know, the other thing that I would just say is that you know there are commercial products out there that help folks find out when the record date's gonna be uh, in order to facilitate recalling to vote. So again, clearly some people care about this. Uh, and since we do think there's such an easy solution to this issue, uh, it's hard for us to think of a reason to not solve it. So why don't you, so tell us your easy solution. So, just so to... the solution, so we considered in the paper a number of possible solutions. You know, one avenue might be for state law to fix this. Another possibility is private ordering. Um, and, you know, Jim, obviously this is a, a solution that you've kind of engaged in on, on other topics and we could perhaps talk about that. But But where we came out was that, this would be a straightforward thing for the SEC to fix itself. So currently the proxy rules require that a proxy statement be filed no later than the day that they're first sent or given to security holders. And our solution we would suggest is that the SEC amend this rule, which is 14A6, um, to say that proxy statements be filed um, no later than the day they're first sent or the date that's five business days before the record date for voting at the meeting for which they're soliciting proxies, whichever of these two dates is the earlier. So it would effectively require companies to file their definitive proxy before the record date for the meeting so that investors had enough time to recall their shares if they wanted to vote and so that they were informed about what would be on the agenda for the meeting uh, if they if they did so that they could decide whether they did wish to vote or not. Well, you know, I read the paper and to me it seems, I mean, it's, you've hit on something that's obviously a large or it could be a large theoretical problem. And I guess, you know, my only concern and probably a lot of other people's concern is what you've already raised is, you know, how how much of a problem is it in reality? I mean, yeah, yeah OK, you've shown in theory this could be this huge problem. But did you talk to anyone at a fund who told you, boy, I wish I would have recalled my shares because this vote happened and I would have voted this way and you know my votes would have put it over the top or or changed things i mean did you get any sense from fund holders that even anecdotal evidence that okay they they recognize the problem and they've seen it happen yeah so again without naming uh, anyone. We did have one uh, sort of couple of interesting conversations um, and at least one saying, well, you know, this doesn't happen very often. I can think of a time in the last couple of years when it did happen. Uh, so, you know, you might say, well, why are you going to all this trouble uh, to change all these rules for one single event? Uh, or you could take it the other way and say, hey, I mean, one every couple of years is maybe enough. I I don't know where you would come out on that, but at least it's not a completely well, theoretical. Well, if you found one, there's probably hundreds of others that you know that are out there because you're not talking to everyone, right? So it's, that's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I suspect that the problem is more pronounced at companies 
where there's a heavy short interest and so you know one thing might be to do, to do companies where there is a heavy short interest are they more likely to come out with their proxy prior to the record date or their uh, you know pre uh, proxy notice or yeah. yeah, and I think when we tried to look into a whole bunch of these different cuts, again, what we basically found was if it's happening 90% of the time, yeah. it's basically always happening. Uh, we didn't, it was interesting, we kind of had all these, or at least I won't speak for Scott, I had all these thoughts in mind about, oh, well, maybe they're doing it, you know, for this reason, maybe they're doing it for that reason. And essentially, I think it's not, at least I have no evidence to suggest that issuers are doing this strategically that they're sort of trying to game the fact that the agenda is hidden. It, it seems like this is just what they do uh, because nobody's really given it a whole bunch of thought and you know they're just following their processes. Well, I wonder if Elon Musk, I guess he didn't sign up for this webinar, but, uh, but he seems to be gaming all kinds of ways. You know, like he'll have the, the board will come out and say, okay, we're gonna go and get, we're gonna put a super majority uh, get rid of supermajority standards. We'll put that on the proxy, and yet Elon Musk votes against it. You know? So uh, you know, so it seems like uh, he's someone who might be uh, willing to game the system if he was, you know, kind of more aware of the idea that oh, we could have hidden agendas and uh, not p tell people. Well, but I think Scott and I would certainly be. It was not our intention to write a paper to, you know, make a, a to-do list for how you could go about doing this. Hopefully that's not the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and Jim, maybe another angle on that perhaps is that, so, you know, Elon Musk might, might be doing that potentially at, at, at Tesla, maybe not so much at, at Twitter. Um, the, you know, these things are of course being driven by the managers putting out their proxy statements for annual meetings. You know, it's not, you know, where there's a, we, we look separately at situations where there are proxy contests or where there are mergers. And in those cases, although the, the, the technical problem still exists, which is that the record date is normally after the definitive proxy is filed, we, we see these as potentially less of a problem because people know in advance that there's going to be right. a, 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 a vote on, on this matter and you know so you might not be able to time your recall precisely around the record date and this is sure. a problem that looks like michael levin brought up in the in the chat which is that there's actually two slightly different problems that are operating simultaneously the problem that we focus on in the paper is hidden agendas so people don't know what's going to be on the agenda but another problem is hidden record dates. So people don't know when the record is going to be before the record date. Um, so that that's technically a problem for even for proxy contests and for mergers. Uh, but for you know, but the the hidden agenda problem is 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 less important right. there. Right, right. right. And just you know the closing the loop on the Twitter point. I actually did send Scott an email when the definitive proxy was filed because. I don't know if anybody else is as much of a nerd about this as I am, but uh, when it was filed, it was actually after the record date had passed. So I was chuckling to oh. myself, wondering if any of, um, you know, any of the, the sort of uh, Elon Musk fans out there who were potentially wanting to buy stock in order to vote against the merger, um, you know, would have been too late at that point. But of course, that would not have been a hidden agenda the way we count that because there had been all sorts of preliminaries filed. Yeah, and so the market was on notice. So that, right. so if, you know, had that happened a couple of years ago and been in our data, we would not have considered that to be a hidden agenda. Yeah. We tried to be very conservative in our counting. Yeah. And, and Jim, the, the, the question that you raised about whether there's, you know, whether this is strategic behavior or not, we, we think the explanation is actually much simpler, which is that it's really just, corporate secretaries and their advisors who are trying to give themselves as much time as possible 
to prepare for the meeting, um, to prepare their proxy statements in, in, in good time. Um, and so given that there aren't any constraints um, that require them to file their proxy statement before the record date, it's not unreasonable to, you know, that, that they're going to do this, that they're going to give them as much time as possible. So really this is just a question of, the norms that have been established in this small world of corporate secretaries and, and their advisors, what advisors are suggesting as best practices. The companies that we see doing this, some of them are the, some of the best advised companies that, that you can imagine with great governance council and you know terrific corporate secretaries who uh, are, are doing this you know, to, to be running their company in, a, in as effective a, as possible away from their perspective. Yeah, well, I, it's similar to uh, one thing that just irks me uh, is as a shareholder, I make presentations and then, and oftentimes I'm the only shareholder that's got a presentation at the company because there's not that many proposals. And uh, three seconds or two seconds after I make my presentation, then they close voting so it's like you know, okay you're making a presentation <laughs> and the idea is you know that maybe you'll change some votes or what you know but of course you know there's a legal obligation to make the presentation but there's no legal obligation to hold voting open and so it's the same kind of well it's just convenient to move the move the meeting along and you know all the votes have happened before the meeting so or you know 99 percent so it doesn't really make any difference and it really doesn't but it seems a little bit like your kind of problem is, is probably not a problem that in most situations but it could be and it certainly doesn't look good uh you know the form is kind of bad because you know you should know what the agenda is before uh the proxy goes out so okay michael let's unmute you and get your question out there You're still muted, Michael. I'll unmute me. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were unmuting me. I just uh, was asking uh, the our distinguished law professors to just summarize quickly the any uh, what kind of regulations, if any, apply to setting record dates. Um, uh, is it a state level, a federal level? Are there any rules at all? You know, who can set them? Can you object? Uh, I don't know which one of you um, yeah. would like to uh, tackle that. So it's a largely well almost entirely a question of state law so depending on where the company is incorporated for um delaware corporations and I, I think this is likely to be the same in most other jurisdictions it's the the board of directors that sets the record date the delaware sets out limits on when the record date can be and the the, the key part for us is that it can be no um, earlier than 60 days before the annual meeting. Um, and I, I think then the, the no closer perhaps than, than 10 days before the annual meeting. Um, so realistically, what ends up happening is for Delaware corporations, Adriana is closer to the, to the numbers, but I think our evidence seems to suggest that the average is about 55 days before the annual meeting is when the record date gets set. So companies are, are looking at the outer bound for how early they can possibly make the record date. And then they they set it, you know, maybe a, a week after the earliest possible date that that they can set it. So for us, this suggests, you know, that proxy statements are generally filed 40 days before the meeting. And this isn't a requirement. Um, except if a company wishes to use notice and access, in which case the proxy statement must be filed at least 40 days before the meeting. Uh, so there's this gap of 15 business days between, you know, when the record date takes place and normally when the proxy statement uh, is, is actually being filed. And, you know, it would be possible to file the proxy statement earlier. It would also be possible to have the record date later because there's this big range that state law gives you right and and um just to well let me let me let you finish then one other quick question occurs to me sorry with that uh, i was just going to chime in and mention one thing which is that delaware does also allow bifurcated record dates 
um, which to our knowledge, no company has actually adopted, um, or at least we certainly poked around and tried to find some and couldn't, uh, which would allow a different record date uh, for, for notice of the meeting uh, and then for, for voting. Uh, but you know, for reasons that aren't completely clear to us, this has not really caught on. Okay, now that you mention it, what is what is record date for notice of the meeting? What what does that mean? So you can imagine you can understand that the record date actually serves two functions. So that one function is to tell the companies the group of shareholders to which they must send notice of the meeting. Right. The other function is to um, definitively determine which set of shareholders can vote at the meeting so that's what adriana is referring to oh. it would be possible for instance to have your record date for figuring out who needs to get notice you could set that 55 days before the the meeting but then figure out the shareholders who are actually entitled to vote at the meeting say 30 days before the meeting so there could be a gap between those two things wow okay yeah um, and then the, the other question that occurred to me, this is again, much more procedural and technical and definitional is that the, 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 the actual act of disclosing the agenda in your research is deemed to be the date on which a definitive proxy is filed with the SEC or mailed or what's, what, what's, what, what, what constitutes unhiding what constitutes disclosing the agenda so we wanted to be conservative uh we wanted to you know make sure we weren't overstating the extent of this problem because we right. view it as a problem so we considered preliminaries to also count as revealing okay. the agenda so we wanted to be if we only counted uh definitives then this would look much worse than we're describing it but right. we don't think that's quite fair so for example in the case of the tesla or sorry, not Tesla, Twitter, uh, right. the other Elon Musk company. Uh, that's why I said that that wouldn't count as a hidden agenda by our measure, because even though the definitive proxy came out after the record date, you know, it was all sorts of stuff that had been filed. So everybody knew. Okay. And just to add to, to that, it's we, we included, so preliminaries and as Adriana was saying, more or less anything that's filed on a schedule 14. Um, so, additional soliciting materials that are required to be filed by anyone that's doing a solicitation, um, functionally anything that could be considered to be soliciting. So transcripts of conference calls um, that are aimed at getting investors to vote, press releases, any, you know, in, in the Twitter situation, there was many, many of those that were filed well in advance. All right. But 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 importantly, we're talking about filings with the SEC rather than like mailing dates or posting on an on an investor relations website or something. That's correct, and there's two reasons for that. The first was um, we do think that you know to the extent that the SEC's got Edgar, uh, it's sort of supposed to be a place where you can like a one stop shop, and so we thought it was sort of fair. Um, and the other thing is just administratively for us to be consistent. We didn't want to have to go track down every single company uh, and look at their investor relation page and, and dig through that. So, so that's why we and did neither it. That do, way. Neither do shareholders. Yeah, right. We don't either. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Mike, functionally, if one of these things is intended to be soliciting material, then under the securities laws, under the proxy rules, they're required to be filed in any case. Now, it, it might be that they're not actually, that in, in a few cases, they're not actually being filed, but certainly things that are related to the actual meeting, which is what we're focused on, those are, there's the requirement to file those as additional soliciting material. Right. Um, and one other kind of technical procedural question. We're talking about not just, this is any shareholder meeting, so it could be any regular annual or also special shareholder meetings but i'm assuming this doesn't has nothing to do with like consent solicitations or anything like that is that, is that right so we broke out we just used the variable i mean again you know we're kind of relying on what our data can tell us so we right. have we broke out the annual meetings from 
uh, special meetings. A lot of those are mergers, but not always. Uh, and then the proxy contests. We took out anything that was written consent because we just did. Yeah, that's that's a different kind of solicitation. And the record date, the appropriate record date, is much harder to calculate. There, it's you know, they're the you know because when the consent statement is filed by the party seeking to act by written consent, they actually set the record date themselves rather than the board setting the record date. So it, it becomes a little yeah, bit yeah. more confusing just from a from different it, different 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 kind of different kind of situation. Right. All right. Let me let me shut up, Jim, and let other people talk. Okay, well, let me ask. Uh... Let me ask Tracy a question. So, so you were at Florida for quite a while uh, and you've got all kinds of experience at uh, CII. So uh, at Florida, were did you recall, did you always, re, did you have a, did you have a policy to always recall, to never recall, to recall in certain situations? Do you remember? So, so so, oh yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So first I want to start with, um, and, and by the way, Alex has, his, has had his hand up, but his, his hand is kind of like in the matched into the color of his background. So oh, after me, okay. get okay. hit out. Thank, thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. Alex, um, you're next then. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. We actually wrote when I was at SBA, a letter to the SEC in 2007. And it was a, it was a um, request for them to amend the rules. And recently it disappeared from the website. I can send you guys a letter if you want. Okay. I actually thought about telling the SEC, like, why did you take our our um, petition down? So um, the rulemaking petition? It was a rulemaking petition. And it was up there for years. I recently looked and it was it was not nowhere to be found. And oh. I know that usually for a proper rulemaking petition, you're supposed to offer specific language, what you want to change. But many people don't do that. And we yeah. didn't do that. Most so of them I, don't. at first I thought maybe that's why they took it down. But no, I found many that that just argued a ration, you know, a reason and said, here's our rationale. Right. So the 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 short answer to your question is, yes, we recalled sometimes when we knew. Um, in fact, a few years ago, we recalled for Tesla for that exact comp vote and the recall failed. So the one thing I would offer is I think five days might be too short because a couple of things need to happen. Um, I would love it if, you know, there are commercial so solutions out there, but they're, they're predictive and they're not, they're usually using like, um, they're usually basing a lot of the annual meetings based on last year's AGM and then backing up a few days. So it'd be great if, if we could get this to be instituted by the SEC, because I, I do think some commercial services would pop up around it. That would be a lot more useful. Um, so we we did try to recall when we knew we often, especially even if it was a proxy contest, would find out when the ballot came came up to us. And then we would see, oh, we got we have these shares on loan. So even though there's preliminary proxies filed, a lot of times we just didn't know because it might not be a newsworthy kind of item. And we didn't really subscribe to those data services because they were expensive and they were inconsistent, and, you know, yada, yada. Um, I, I find it interesting because we also have had asked for people along along this whole 15 year journey. Um, CII actually changed their policy in 2007. One of our one of our um, our executive director at Florida at the time was on the board of CII. So they actually changed their policy and it says something very close to companies should disclose the record, the record dates um, and the ballot items in advance of the proxy, uh, the record date when possible, something something a little bit squishy. Um, but we too at CII have, have been looking at this, asking members what they think. And we, we also have gotten kind of a, a pros and cons from different people. I think the one thing that sometimes is lost among members that are considering this, some of them don't want to recall. And so they say, well, I don't really like this because they it might put pressure on them to recall. And my response to that is then don't recall. This will at least improve some of the pricing efficiency that you're getting. Because if everybody has their shares on loan because they don't know to recall, some people who would have recalled are, are not able to make that decision. So it actually leads to kind of like an oversupply and it can change the pricing. So I'm like, you still want this because you want some other people to recall and then your shares make more money. <laughs> so I'm hoping to show people that there's something in this for everything. Um, there's even a proposed rule recently to certain types of asset managers where they might now have to disclose the shares that they have on loan over the record date as part of their NPX disclosures. So there's a, a big variety of viewpoints and interest on this. 
Um, you know, we have corporate members at CII also, and some of them are not real thrilled about the idea of this because it, it does cut the amount of time that they have um, to file proxy statements. But essentially, I, there are a number of people that would recall if they were able to get this information consistently. Um, and it's exactly like you said, Jim, for those meetings where it really counts. You know, we had, when I was at Florida, some shares on loan over the record date for that P&G meeting where there was that very, very close proxy contest. Um, I don't think we had 50,000 shares on loan, but we we certainly could have in, in, a, in a normal situation. So I do think that this is important. And when it's important, it's, it's pivotally important. Um, and even when it's not important, you should still have the option, um, you know, proxy votes is a financial asset of the portfolio. And I, I, my personal opinion is that this is, this is important for people to make informed decisions and for the pricing efficiency access up, impact of it, it, it should be allowed. So Tracy did, so was your petition, did you have a similar recommendation as um, Scott and Adriana do in their paper? Or? I can't remember if we put in a number of days or not, but we said the proxy act, the proxy statement should be disclosed before the record date because uh -huh. otherwise you, you people are flying blind. I used, I wrote it, but Coleman signed it. So it's like, it's like 30 year old Tracy language where I'm like really taking it to them, you know, telling them how unfair it is. And it, it's because I, you know, in my mind, the AC, the SEC exists to level the playing field to right. make sure that there's not asymmetric information. And we made the argument that this is asymmetric. There's people right. that know what's on the ballot. There are Right. Um, proponents. There are, in the case of contests, you know, it's not always even like people that are at the company um, who are privileged by that pri by that somewhat private information. It can be proponents or it can be people that are involved in like merger facilitations. So because there's some people that know and some people that don't and some people can act on that and some people can't, we really felt like that was a core SEC uh, mission. So when we wrote the letter, we, we tried to strenuously make that argument. Um, if if CII, you know, we're still kind of surveying our members. I, I think our intention is to wait and see how the proposed rules on the disclosure of the SEC lending shares for those asset managers works out. And then kind of like check in with our members and our board and figure out if we want to do our own petition and kind of, you know, 2020, it and, and, and build upon, mention that the research that you guys have done, I think this is really great. And it helps shed a light on a pretty, pretty dimly lit corner of, of finance, but I think an important one. Well, this is music to my ears. Uh, whenever, <laughs> as an academic, I have to admit, I don't know how Scott feels, but whenever I write something or I find some fact in my research, I was like, is this really true? I mean, it seems true, and yeah. but I'm always terrified that somebody who actually does this for a living day in, day out is going to show up and say, well, that's clever, but it's not actually the way the world works for the following very simple reason. And so this is yeah. terrific. No, I cheered your paper. I, I remember there was a paper by Susan, is it Christofferson on this issue? And she, they did some research where they came to the conclusion that because I think it was that the lending supply, they, they found that it didn't change over the record date. So they came away with it for, by drawing the conclusion that, um, I, I, they actually said institutional investors might not know how they want to vote their shares, so they just leave them out over the record date. And I was horrified. I was like, no, it's that they don't know to recall. And so they just basically said institutional investors don't value this vote. And I was uh, like, as, as, as the close to an academic paper made me cry in my life well, with that one. This one made me literally It certainly used so. to be the case, though, Tracy. I mean, you know, back in the 1990s or whatever. It's, yeah. Uh, and that is an older one. I think I think their paper was 2002 or something. Uh -huh. yeah. in, in well, Tracy. Alex, let me call on you next because yeah, it's I see the hand now, but it's it does blend it in blends. with the background. And thanks for, yeah, listen, for Michael yeah. and Scott to point that out. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, just uh, because I come with a fixed income background and uh, the engagement part of the not voting, proxy voting. Uh, technical question, how long does it take to recall a stock? Is there a settlement date? Is it pretty much imminent on the day one? And then uh, listening to Adriana speak, I'm picking up, um, I must admit, I haven't read the paper and job number one is to read the paper. But uh, but uh, when you say hidden agenda, I'm assuming it's as, as plain as it gets, an agenda that people don't know that is going to be put forward as opposed to solving for 
a peculiar outcome when there's a strategic proxy in place uh, whose language does not necessarily ma match the desired outcome. Yeah, so that that's just a, you know, it, it's a law review article, so you need to come up with a clever title or nobody will read it. And so we don't mean hidden agenda in the way people use it in the political context where, you know, you say one thing, but you mean another. We literally just mean you don't know the meeting's agenda. And so mm -hmm. it is sort of hidden in that sense. But, you know, we thought, I don't know, I don't remember how we came up with it, but we thought it was kind of clever. So we went with that. Uh, and on the, the stock, uh, do you know how long does it take to recall one? So our, uh, Scott's unmuted himself, so he's probably better informed than I am, but my understanding is one day, it's not immediate, it's at least a couple of days. It's, you know, okay, so the, within the five days, your suggestions, like a couple of days will be chewed up for the settlement and... Oh yeah, we only, I mean, so, you know, the five days was us being very, very conservative uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of, we thought that was an absolute minimum that you need to tell people so that they could then put in the recall, you know, the, the, the day after that, and then I you know, get it back in time to be able to actually vote it. But that gives them no time to actually read the thing and digest it and figure out if they want to vote it. So, you know, we are very much not wedded to the five days. The five days was to try to be as inobtrusive as possible uh, to, you know, have the, the least amount of potential for objection. Uh, mm -hmm. from the issuers. So, you know, if somebody wanted to come back and say, we think this is great, but, you know, it really needs to be 15 days and not five, we would say, great, that's terrific, happy to do it. Um, but five is bare minimum to make this get off the ground in our view. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you. And the last question is, have you guys looked at Exxon when the battle happened? Um, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming for BlackRock who came in the last minute and State Street, uh, they presumably had conducted this massive operations of recalling securities, or I'd be I'd be just curious how much of a swing vote that meant. So we didn't look at Black or at at Exxon or or BlackRock's holdings in particular. I think mostly because. Uh, that wouldn't show up as a hidden agenda in our data either, because there was lots of information available, even though you may not have known the exact record date. Mm -hmm. So it could still be possible, just like in the Twitter case, the example I gave where, you know, you, you wouldn't actually know the official record date until after the definitive proxy was filed. There was still notice out there that, you know, there is a proxy contest happening. And so if you were diligently reading every filing on Edgar associated with this company, which is asking a lot of people, but if you were reading that, you would know that there was something coming, even if you didn't know the exact date. So that's another ex instance of us being extra conservative to make sure we're understating the extent of the problem. Uh, this is one of those weird academic things where we would much rather dramatically understate the problem than even just slightly overstate the problem. Because uh, otherwise the, people uh, yell and scream at you. Yeah, and I, and I said this was the last question, so I apologize for this. Uh, and in the context of the language itself, when a proxy gets filed, because some language with, uh, you have a really good idea, a really good proxy, but but the language is, is suboptimal in terms of execution. It's really, really easy to dismiss as a non-material issue or what have you. Uh, the, however, there is a value for other shareholders looking at this language and say, hold on a second, you're missing the mark here. I like where you're going, but I can come up with a crisper tone. Uh, is there a way to catch this early? So Alex, so j just to make sure I think that we understand what you're talking about, you're, you're suggesting that if someone submits a, a shareholder proposal, that the, the, the shareholder proposal might, there might be other investors that might support the proposal. In, but written differently. Yeah. So if, like, if, uh, if I think about, uh, yeah, if I think about gender equality or climate change, I mean, 99% of this is getting voted down. And being an ESG person myself, I don't actually blame them to be voted down because they're so generic. It's just, they're not really asking anything. If you are a treasurer or CEO of the company, your job is to vote it down. However, uh, it's a good thing to do. So if somebody can come up with a CRISPR, almost uh, uh, litigation attorney type language, uh, uh, you, you give an offer that the company cannot refuse. So rather than missing an opportunity on a generic language, you get a heads up that something may be coming. So you can just maybe file a new one that is crisper than that. That, that that i understand that as as a potential problem but it's not something that our legislative or regulatory solution would be able to fix uh, and that's because as 
Jim, Jim knows maybe better than anyone here. Uh, the timetable for submitting shareholder proposals is very exacting. So shareholder proposal needs to be submitted, I, I think, 120 days before the anniversary of the last meeting date. So we would be getting the company to push back the filing of its proxy, you know, 10 days before, you know, five, five days before its record date so conceivably you know 60 or 70 days before the meeting but the shareholder proposal might need to be filed you know at least 120 and probably more like 160 days before the meeting so there wouldn't be a chance to revise the shareholder proposal without the company consenting to that and once they've put out their proxy statement you know my, my guess is that companies jim you're interested in hearing your experience that it, it's it would be a non-starter for the company to agree to that. No, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, to Adriana's point earlier, as an academic uh, second guessing, maybe if it's known or not known or brushed off by professionals, uh, speaking as a fixed income uh, person myself, uh, uh, I find it's it's the most favorite trick in the financial services industry to make somebody feel stupid just saying it's done already. And I tend to brush it off uh, completely. Uh, anything that is closer to first principles tends to work best. Uh, because the legislation tends to keep up rather than front run a particular point. Thank you. So Michael's got his hand up, but I'm yes, sure I have, we I have, have time for Eric too. So. Oh, um, I have another question. So, yeah, so it, it sounds like the analytics and all the data that went into this pertain to uh, sh share lending and borrowing. Were there other domains just in terms of just outright share buying and selling that seemed to be relevant to, or, 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 or would the problem of not knowing agendas or even record dates, but let's talk about agendas, um, to what extent did your modeling or did your thinking extend to other types of acts related to uh, rights like share buying and share selling? So when, so you're absolutely right. I mean, if you just, if you don't currently own shares and you would like to buy I shares see, in order yeah, to vote. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I want to vote on that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the reason we didn't focus on that was because you know, normally when we think about governance and whose governance rights we're most concerned with, it's sort of the people with the long-term economic interest that runs with the company right. uh, who, who are most concerned with the long-term success of this company. And, you know, share lenders are the, the folks that are in this funny situation where they do have the long term economic interest, but for periods of time, for totally legitimate reasons, they disenfranchise themselves. And right. so those were the folks that we chose to focus on. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's certainly absolutely true that this also goes for anybody else in the market. Yeah. Just and, 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 and part of the problem there is that I would assume is that the data trying to get data on who bought or sold or who wanted to buy or sell. I mean, it's that's that's logically impossible. I think that's logically impossible. It is. And then you also run into the problem where people say, or at least some folks will say, well, wait a minute, but why do I care that somebody can't swoop in, vote on something, you know, and then sell again? I mean, maybe I don't want that sort of, people get very worried about so-called empty voting. And right. so if you start writing a paper saying, hey, it's hard for people to empty vote, folks are going to look at you like you've lost it. Like, OK, great. That's sort of what we want. Uh, so we kind of decided to just acknowledge that great. that is true, cool. uh, but it wasn't our focus. Cool. All right. I have, I have another question later once you get to some others, Jim. OK, we'll let Eric go and we can go back to Michael. Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, just a, I, just a basic question on what you mean by uh, uh, publishing or releasing the agenda. What does that actually really entail? Is that just the uh, the overarching name uh, uh, that encapsulates the agenda? Is there a description? You know, there's a, um, when I think about the difference between just an annual meeting, uh, unless it's uh, a solicited uh, a competitive process, or a, a special meeting, which you know, largely M and A, uh, there's there's different kinds of information that's released. So, particularly in M and A, you you may not find situations where um, the agendas are hidden just because, you know, there's a deal announced. Uh, the, the issuer puts a PowerPoint up that describes the deal. 
that may be considered uh, advanced uh, uh, soliciting information, and then that may, may uh, start the clock ticking. On the other hand, you may know the agenda, um, but until the a preliminary or even a, sometimes a definitive proxy is even published, you don't know what's behind it. There's no discussion of uh, what was the process, were there competitive bidders? Um, the only reason why you may know it uh, is just because the proxy may just sit at the SEC for so so long that that actually is the main reason why you may know the actual full agenda and have full information before the record date and and uh, at the time to vote. So if you could just talk a little bit about that, that would uh, that would be helpful. Mm. And Eric, I think you, you've summed it up very nicely to two slightly different problems. Maybe what I, I would distinguish between what we did in the academic study and then what we propose. What what we did was we looked at any filing that was on a Schedule 14A or a variant thereof. So mm -hmm. that meant that for a merger, there would be many filings in advance that weren't actually the preliminary or the definitive proxy statement. So they didn't set out specifically what the matters to be voted on are. And to go to Alex's point, they, they didn't um, specifically mention exactly how the proposal would be phrased. But for a merger special meeting or for a proxy contest, you know, these would at least let everyone know that there is going to be a vote on the merger agreement or in the proxy contest, there's going to be a vote on whether to elect the management's nominees or the dissidents nominees. Um, but, but you're exactly right that it didn't give the exact agenda. On the question of what we would propose, we propose that the entire proxy statement be filed. And I think that's because we have the same intuition that you do, that it's important not just to know the subject matter of what's being voted on, but the specifics and to have enough information to be able to evaluate that. And of course, the SEC has thought very carefully about what information investors need in order to evaluate a compensation vote or an election of directors, and they've required that that information be included in the proxy statement. So that's why we say that the proxy statement should be required before the record date. You could think about other alternative regulatory solutions that might perhaps place less of a burden on company management to prepare the fully detailed, you know, punctuation perfect version of the proxy statement sufficiently in advance. Some you, you might be able to think about just a, a list of agenda items that could later on be amended, but without, say, all of the backup information that's required in the proxy statement. I mean, we're open to those solutions. And to go back to Tracy's point earlier, I think you know it would be great to have a, a broader discussion. I think CII would be a, an excellent organization to set up a forum like that and a kind of a broad discussion um, with its broad group of members. To, to see what what the right balance between you know specific disclosure or proxy statement, the reasonable um, constraints and necessities of being a corporate secretary to figure out what the right regulatory solution is. And you know we put forward an idea, but we think this should be something for discussion with you know all of the interested stakeholders in in on the issue. Thanks, uh, and, and I, I, I like the idea of the, the whole uh, uh, proxy being uh, uh, disclosed instead of just some type of summary. And just one other one, do you have, um, have you got any feedback from issuers or I mean, do you even have a, a good understanding of the history of how we got here? I understand the, the mess on the state side, but why on the federal side, from a disclosure perspective, things were structured in such a way that this loophole just sort of has existed and persisted? So I have a, a theory, uh, which I, I think is right, which is, uh, so I was chatting with a friend of mine who is a, an AGC. Uh, again, when I was trying to do the sanity test, like, is what I'm saying true? You know, do other people see your agenda before you file it? Uh, and he looked at me and he said, how do you want us to send them the proxy before we know who to send the proxy to? Right. So back in the day when you had to mail these things to people, it was illogical to say you have to give it to them before you have to figure out who they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually think that that's what's going on. It's just mm -hmm. a holdover from before we had Edgar when, you know, everybody just checked it online. 
And I think that makes perfect sense. And so I, I kind of laughed and, you know, went on with my day. <laughs> Adriana, that's what? what people, oh, I'm sorry, Scott. Oh, no, go ahead, Tracy, go ahead. I, I just going to say, we've heard the same thing when we, when we brought this up in 2006 and seven. And, you know, part of the reason that in our letter back then we asked just for ballot items was because the two main complaints we heard from people were, especially the corporates were, how can we send them in advance? And we were like, that's, you know, it's because you have Edgar, you can file it. Um, but they, we were a little bit more sensitive to the argument that um, they're, they're really coming down to the wire and they need that extra time um, to get the whole statement. So at the time we made the decision just to say, hey, we really need the ballot items in our SEC letter. But I, I think that was kind of a mistake. I think that the, in the entire proxy statement, it, it, without the context, it's just really hard to argue that you would fully know whether to recall, and it just it, it doesn't have the complete argument. Um, and then, you know, just to Scott's earlier point about our members, you know, we talked about this the other day on one of our calls with um, a group of asset manager and asset owner members. And it's funny because most people agree that they want it. But as soon as we talk, started talking about this whole, you know, 10 day kind of solution, the, the people were like, well, why don't we also fix this? And why don't, you know, like this is proxy plumbing. And I'm like, no, because it, it's just going to be perfect as enemy the good and we're never going to get anything done. It's going to go right back into this proxy plumbing issue. Somebody was like, why do we have the record date at all? And I was like, you guys, <laughs> this is never going to make any headway if we if we bog it down. It's just, that's why it's so hard. Well, one, one thought I have is, you know, they have to send the thing to the printer. Right. And the printer takes a few days to print the things and send them out. So at, at the very least, whenever it is, and, you know, I haven't done a, a systematic survey of when people send these things to the printer, but at the very least, it would be no burden to file it that day. Right. So that's already bought you a few days. And I think my, my real feeling is whatever burden on the company is outweighed. It is just my personal too. Like, don't describe this to CII because I'll get in trouble. But whatever burden it is to companies, it it's outweighed by the benefit to to investors. And I, you know, I don't have proof to show that. It's just my anecdotal, my personal experience in voting at a at an institutional investor, and then talking to a lot of my investor friends. I I feel like they do all this work to inform us so that we can vote. Why would, why would, you know, we want to be able to recall those shares if we want. And I've had a few people say, well, then don't lend, but you know, that we're long-term owners. I, I think it's highly unfair to say, I'm not going to give you information. You need to make informed dis decisions. You just need to, you know, never lend your shares. I, I think that's a little bit disingenuous, but we heard, we heard that argument as well. So we could go back to Michael for a minute. I forgot my question. <laughs> It's gone. <laughs> well, I have, I have one thing. Maybe, Jim, a couple of re, uh, kind of reflections on, on okay. Tracy's point. Um, I think we kind of would, would agree with kind of everything that, that, that you said. Um, the, you know, one, um, one part of this, I think, is um, the, you know, general uh, company secretaries kind of act within a set of, of legal constraints and, you know, were the SEC to change its rules, they would find ways of doing this. Now, this might impose some extra additional costs and, and I think it would be interesting to kind of hear in a debate, you know, kind of what exactly those would be. Maybe uh, there needs to be extra headcount in the general counsel's office to prepare these um these documents on time um but but you know, if, if that's the case maybe that's a cost that investors are, are willing to bear to actually get the information that they need to vote um in in advance of of the record date and then kind of uh, an, another point is that we, we think on the on the question you raised about this the interaction between this and, and proxy plumbing one of the reasons we wrote this paper was because it we thought that this would be fairly low hanging fruit for the SEC. Proxy plumbing is obviously a, a very important issue, and you, but, but as you say, a, a very complex one. Yeah. 
this is something that we thought the SEC could deal with in a discreet way with a, a fairly simple adjustment, you know, after having a period of figuring out and discussing with the stakeholders what the appropriate change was. But we thought that one of the attractive features of trying to fix this problem is that it might be a way just to make the voting system a little bit better in a way that would be fairly straightforward for the SEC to, to implement. Well, I, one thing uh, before we close out, one thing that I've been thinking of after reading the paper is, well, you know, this would be an easy shareholder proposal. I could file proposals at companies and and then if we actually won uh, those uh, votes, then that would be additional information that the SEC, if you go to the SEC and say, okay, we filed 10 shareholder proposals, they all won, well then, you know, that would bolster the argument. Uh, and but the thing is, um, it's better to file at a company that's had a problem. I, you know, like I'm filing a few proposals on uh, let's vote on golden parachutes. You know, well, those are easier wins where the company, you know, loses its uh, compensation, its pay, pay votes every year routinely, you know, you could say, okay, well, there, here's a company where, you know, you really want a vote on golden parachutes because you can see that, you know, they've ignored shareholders and they've continued to be outrageous. So just throwing out to the people who are uh, here now and those that listen to the podcast, if you know of companies or know of situations where hidden agendas, you know, might have actually made a difference, then, you know, that would be a place that I might be likely to file. So if you pass that information on to me, so. Any last minute uh, comments or questions from anyone else there? Jim, Can I maybe... just get 30 seconds? Uh, oh, sorry, Scott. Sure. I know, uh, I was just gonna say on, on Jim's suggestion of uh -huh. the private ordering, I think we would be in favor of that and think that would be useful. You know, we, we don't think it should be a substitute for SEC action, oh, no. um, especially on this where, you know, it's it's fairly, you know, fairly clear fix um, that, that could be done by the SEC. But, you know, I think as a way of bringing attention to this problem, we would encourage that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Scott and Adriana, since you've done all this research and have gone through the trouble of highlighting the issue, um, there's one thing that I'm looking is this Index Act filed by S4241. So currently five days that you're budgeting for is a hidden agenda to be exposed to the managers. Uh, maybe a suggestion is to think where the pack is going and that is allow some more time for the managers to make it available to the end investors. Uh, to allow for the pooled voting capability, because it looks like the pool voting capability is coming in uh, strong and being lobbied against in some uh, circumstances. But if you're going through this trouble of asking for it, uh, maybe you can counter the step that is coming after that. That's really helpful. Thank you. All right, Eric, do you have any, uh, you had a, a laundry list before, but I don't uh, well, that's what it's separate. But the the the, the one thing that that uh, just sort of strikes me uh, when I think about you know boards that have been on and whether we were whether it was an annual meeting, a special meeting, or or other situation, um, uh, or companies that I've worked for doing this, uh, the process just wasn't geared around the proxy and disclosure and the needs of institutional or, or retail investors. It was largely driven around, okay, when are my board members available for the annual meeting? And you work backwards from there and you set your record date and then push comes to shove. You know, eventually a draft, you know, of the proxy makes its way around. It takes people forever to read it and get back and then there are changes. Um, and then eventually you get something that you you submit. And I, my sense is, is that's why, you know, things are sort of screwed up the way they are uh, because it's backward driven um, and it shouldn't be. But um, um, you know, just sort of a side comment, but uh, in any case. Okay. I think we'd agree that that's, you know, the, the, the challenges on the corporate secretary side is what what's driving a lot of this. Um, but, you know, like we, I think our thought is if the, corporate secretary had additional constraints to incorporate such as, you know, a requirement to file before the 
record date, then they would make it work. They would get in touch with the board, the directors earlier. And, you know, they're, they're very good at doing their jobs and they, you know, and, and complying with, <laughs> with SEC rules. So they would, they would make all of that happen. But I think, it, you know, Eric, you're absolutely right that, you know, we also want to be mindful of not placing an undue burden on them, but thinking about how what they do can also be balanced with what's best for investors. All right. Well, with that, watch this space and uh, we'll have future guests, which I hope will be as exciting as uh, you two have been today. So thanks very much. And uh, maybe we'll listen to you. Maybe you'll talk to Jeff Mahoney or somebody. I, I don't know if you've done that yet, but if you have. Adriana then... has. Yeah. Oh, OK. All right. Yes. I, I thought I thought I had heard that. So. All right. Well, thank great. you. Thank you so much. This has been great fun. And thank you so much for your interest.